Next on the Broadway show, Broadway sizzles with Some Like It Hot. We're talking to the all-star creative team, Matthew Lopez and Amber Ruffin. Plus, rapper slash actor Common makes his Broadway debut in Between Riverside and Crazy. He's on the show, too. And we're also on the red carpet for another star-studded opening night on Broadway. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show. So glad you could be here for another great episode of The Broadway Show. I'm Tamsin Fidel. Let's get started. Wintertime is heating up on Broadway with the arrival of Some Like It Hot. It's a new musical comedy based on Billy Wilder's iconic film. It still takes place back in the day, but there are some pretty cool updates for a modern audience, thanks to a stellar creative team. Paul's here with the story. That's right, Tamsin. Emmy-nominated comedy queen Amber Ruffin is making her Broadway debut alongside the Inheritance Tony winner Matthew Lopez as co-book writers of Some Like It Hot. I sat down with the delightful duo to find out about bringing this fan favorite movie to the stage in 2022. I'm fans of yours individually for your work. And now look at you're, you're together on Broadway. Yay, yeah. two great tastes that go great together. So let's talk about the history of this property. People know, obviously, some like a hot. People obviously love this story. Yeah, this show has a ton of history. Yeah. And people love it and pass that love down from generation to generation. Yes. And that is like where we are so lucky. So it is an honor to get to take the thing so many people love and rip it up into one million pieces <laughs> and then reassemble it <laughs> to be completely different. There is nothing funnier than people in over their heads. Mm -hmm. Like there's nothing funnier. And in the case of like in the movie, there's nothing funnier than idiots in trouble. Like, Idiots in Trouble is funny. The idea is to take Idiots in Trouble and make it for a 21st century audience. It's the same things they know and love about the story, yeah. but this is also a movie that was created by Billy Wilder and I.L. Diamond, right? They wrote a bunch of beautiful, hilarious, classic Hollywood comedies. But, you know, cis white dudes, right? They didn't look like us. They didn't look like you, yeah. right. And so you have brought yourselves and your lived experience to this, which is exciting. You know, I've said in the past that like yesterday's ahead of the curve is today's behind the curve. You know, the biggest difference that I think is between our, our show and, and the movie is, I mean, first of all, it's Tony Curtis, Jack Lemmon, and, and Marilyn Monroe. Like, I always say, like, they're they, pretty good. Yeah, they, and they're also not available. Uh, <laughs> so you have an opportunity to completely just change who these characters are. And so, with all three of the of the leads, we just we we rethought them from scratch. I mean, I don't know how much of our own lived experience is in the show. I think I think what is more to the point is that we are we are people who live in the world in the 21st century, and we are people who don't resemble the people who made the movie originally or who made the first musical originally, mm -hmm. and we have a different idea of what is funny and what isn't funny. Mm -hmm. And to the audience. Uh, for the original movie, Two Cis Men in Dresses was funny. Mm -hmm. I, neither of us think that's funny. So it's hard to make a joke out of something that you don't find funny. What I do think is funny is Idiots in Trouble. Amber, I want to talk to you about joining this team. You joined the team at a time that there was a lot of talk about getting more diversity behind the scenes on Broadway and making sure that we were really telling stories with authenticity and new voices. This Some Like It Hot obviously has great diversity in the cast yeah. that was not in the film, which is yeah. amazing. I said yes to Some Like It Hot for two reasons. One, the team is outstanding. You yeah. know, you've got Mark and Scott and Casey and Matthew. So I I did want to work with them because with the that's a yeah. once in a lifetime opportunity. Sure. You know, you'd be learning at, at such a rate. And I also said yes to this show because the lead is a black lady. <laughs> and then that's it. I was like, oh my God, yeah. Uh, getting to write for a black woman on Broadway, I do want to do that. I hear a trumpet singing and then moonlight fills the sky. A trombone whispers softly and the clouds keep drifting by. But when a saxophone starts moaning while the moon drops out of view to turn a darker shade of blue. 
So what was it like tackling the character of Sugar in yeah. 2022? Obviously, Marilyn Monroe is her own thing. Yeah. And you're able to really look at it just as a character and, and a black woman. Yeah, you know, usually when you write a black person at all, it's kind of a tightrope walk because you know you can't get anywhere near any stereotypes, right? Mm -hmm. You can't be a little late or you're kind of the stereotype of lazy or you can't be a little loud or you're the stereotype of mean. Mm -hmm. So you have to walk this very odd tightrope. But this cast is so diverse that we just got to write a human being. And then she could just be all of the flaws and all of the good things. And you didn't have to do that normal, yeah. you know, black person in a white show right. and then they have to be inauthentic. Mm -hmm. She could just be a, a human being. Instead of writing the show through the white lens, we just got to write the show with no mm. freaking lens. It, yeah. it was... It's a delight. But you did write it through the lens of 2022. I mean, ah. modern sensibility, right? So we have to talk about Jerry. Jerry, I think, is the character that people are really going to walk away being amazed by the journey of Jerry. What seems like a very modern story in terms of the conversations we're having as a society, but, but in a period piece, is that sort of interesting? It's simple. Our ideas of what a period piece are formed by the period in which that art was made, in mm -hmm. which there are so many restrictions yeah. on, on who can tell what story and about, and about whom these stories are told. It isn't as if queer people just magically sprung up from the right. ground in 1969. Right. They were there <laughs> all along. <laughs> queer people, uh, non-binary people, yeah. trans people, a, a, and every 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 LGBTQIA uh, individual mm -hmm. was there on the planet Earth in 1933. They just didn't make movies about them. They didn't write novels about them. Yeah. We were not gone. We were just not talked about. Mm. And so the idea of a 21st century lens on this story is a bit of a misnomer. Mm. What it really is, is removing the 20th century lens from it. Mm. And if you remove the 20th century lens from the story, it automatically right. works today. And all we needed to do was just clean that lens. Want to see more of Paul's interview? Head over to Broadway.com for the extended cut. Between Riverside and Crazy has a new address on Broadway. In his Broadway debut, rapper Common plays the role of Junior. My Broadway debut is like, it's one of the things I dreamed of, but kind of never dreamed of, <laughs> meaning I never knew I could do it when I was like a little kid. And growing up, I loved theater. So I love going to plays. And as an adult, I've, I always go to plays. So, um, and once I began acting, I dreamed of being a part of a play. I love what theater does for me. Like, like I said, as an audience member and just now, being able to participate even in rehearsals, I love what it does. So I'm very grateful that Between Riverside and Crazy is my Broadway debut and my heart and soul is in it and I'm just extremely geeked. <laughs> my first introduction to the work was actually reading the play, getting a meeting with Stephen Adley Gerges, and him being like, I like you, but you got you got audition. <laughs> and I was like, okay. I wanted the role very bad, and I was like excited to audition, to be honest. I was like, okay, that'll make me feel like I even deserve to be here more if I get the role. So I was grateful for that, and I just started digging into the work after that. The writing was, it's rich, it's colorful, it's, it's about people. I was feeling like, I, I mean, I can smell New York, I can see New York, I feel New York. And New York is such a colorful place in itself. So reading this, this play and, and like looking at these characters and being like, okay, this guy, Pops, is, he was a police officer, but he went through this with the police force and is suing the police force. Now his son is formerly incarcerated, but also was an addict, but is also trying to take care of him in his own way. It just showed me the complexity of people. You know, one thing I've learned about life is like, we all have good and bad in us. And, you know, we strive for good and we want to see the good in each other and put good out there. But 
we do make bad choices and we experience some bad things in life. When a story can do that without judging and, and can tell it in a way where I was laughing when I was reading the script, but I also was really feeling the, the undercurrent of like the weight of a lot of things that these people were going through. For me, I love excellent writing and I felt that in, in Stephen Adley Geertz's, in, in his writing, in his play. I always want to create a human being when I take on a character. Junior was, he had a lot of conflict with his, with his father. He had some friction. And you also found out he was formerly incarcerated. I, want, I wanted to make sure I played them as a human being because that's not all of who they are. Those, those are some aspects of what they've experienced and what some choices they made, but that's not all of who he is. I've been fortunate enough to meet people who um, are incarcerated because I've go, done work in prisons. And one of the most important things that they always said to me, I said, what can I do for you? They said, man, just let people know we're human beings. And that always resonated with me. And I did it in my ways of going out and speaking to, about the criminal justice system. I've done it in ways of trying to get bills passed into laws to help people incarcerated and work on healing. But now I feel like I can do it in creating this character who is a whole human being. And people can see this person and not just look at them as, oh man, this dude, was, he was locked up and he's just a dope fiend. Because who don't relate to wanting to be loved by their parents? <laughs> you know, we all relate to that. No matter what, what walk of life you're from, what nationality you are, how much talent you got, what your religion is, you want to be loved. My head is truly into this, this work. I'm going on Broadway and my family gonna be there to see me. <laughs> And people are going to be coming to see great art and great work. And I'm doing Between Riverside and Crazy. My acting teacher always told me, man, through the work, we can inspire, we can heal, we can change people through the work. That's my goal. My, that's my vision. The seed and the beginning and the true purpose is the work and what you can do to change and inspire people and bring just joy to people. And you know, all the rest will be added if it, if you, you know, do things in in that highest way, in that highest way. We're celebrating another huge opening night on Broadway. A beautiful noise. The Neil Diamond musical is now open on Broadway. Will Swenson brings the story of an undeniable great to life every night. The musical featuring Neil Diamond's biggest hits, including Crackling Rosie and Sweet Caroline. On opening night, we hit the red carpet with the stars. I think we're all figuring out how to do a jukebox musical more creatively. I think we started out and we were like, let's slap the songs up there and it'll sort of be a concert and it'll be a lot of fun. And then, um, and then the rules started changing and things, you know, what well, people got creative. This one is unlike anything I've ever seen. I mean, it's, uh, I think people will come expecting to have a good time and a good sing-along, but they're gonna be really floored by the emotional center of it. I think it's, I think it's really unconventional and really moving. Without giving anything away, there's a surprise at the very beginning of the show, and it's kind of everything is turned on its head, I think. And I that that they conceived to do it that way, I think, was brilliant. And it really pulls, I think, I hope, it pulls people in. You know, like, wait, what is this? The end of this musical is just so special. Even thinking about it, my I get the lump in my throat and my eyes start to water because we are making so many people happy. Neil Diamond was their person in their prime. You can see these these this older generation who loved him, they go back 30 years. If you find an artist that tells interior uh, is sort of self-examining lyrics, like biographical lyrics, they tell their story through their songs. Neil Diamond's one of those. To have him in the rehearsal room while I'm portraying him has been crazy and thank goodness never intimidating. I mean, I was nervous as could be the first few times, but he's been really nurturing and really supportive and, and positive and, and he's, he's complimented me so much that I've got his blessing. So if the critics hate me forever, it doesn't matter because Neil thinks I'm great and that's all that matters to me. Reaching out,
This is The Broadway Show. We're going to be back in just a few. Thanks for staying with us for this latest episode of The Broadway Show. When I grow up, once upon a time, there was a little girl who was trapped. <laughs> when I grow up. This is the story of her great escape. A new telling of Roald Dahl Matilda the Musical arrives on the big screen this month, and it'll hit Netflix Christmas Day. The musical movie stars Oscar winner Emma Thompson and 13-year-old Alicia Weir in the title role. Let's go ahead and check back in with Paul Wontorek. Alicia, it's so nice to meet you. You know, when this was a stage musical, four actresses had to share this role. How does it feel to get to play Matilda all by yourself? It feels amazing, very surreal. I can't believe it. And it's been going, like, since I've got the part and now that it's coming out soon, it hasn't sunk in yet. And I, there are so many incredible kids that must have auditioned, so I don't know how it happened, but I'm grateful that it did happen. Alicia was born in Dublin, probably around the time that you started working on this project. Thank you, Paul. What was it like to find her and to expand your very theatrical stage version to the more literal film world beautifully, I, I might add? Well, it, it was exciting. You know, often it's not the, you're not allowed as the theatre director isn't the same person that directs the film. They give it to somebody else. And I understand that. I understand why, because you've got to, really uh, let go of a lot of things and uh, see it in a completely new way. But I think because um, I'd lived with the stage show for over 12 years now, it was possible, I had enough time to reconceive it and to um, let go of some of the things that I love or even betray some of the things I felt so passionately about first time and just think of some, the story in a new light um, as a gift, as a, an opportunity, as a privilege to be able to imagine a story that I loved in a new way and to let my imagination kind of fly free. Matthew, I feel like since I saw the musical on Broadway, the world has actually seen a lot of tyrants. And I, you know, I just saw a video of school children in Iran chasing their headmistress. Do you feel like Matilda actually um, has more to say about the world than maybe some people expect it to? I think it possibly does, and I think maybe it's a message of, of hope that we kind of deserve and need uh, at the moment in that regard. But it was interesting because um, I decided that I wanted a statue of, of Trunchbull outside the school. And of course, if you put a statue of Trunchbull outside the school, then in Revolting Children, it's got to be pulled down, obviously. And at that very time, you know, there was a whole lot of things going down with people pulling down statues and monuments. And it felt like history was kind of converging. So yeah, there were certain sort of hidden uh, messages about tyranny, um, oppression, and the fight for freedom that are con always contained within the stories. One of the things I love about it, it's always been there. But maybe in, in a film right now, I have slightly dialed those things up, possibly, yeah. Alicia, Emma Thompson as Miss Trunchbull is really mean to you on screen, but I know she's a nice lady. What was it like seeing her on camera and then dealing with her off camera? When I first saw her with all like her prosthetics and like her costume on, I was a bit scared, but then when she was started talking to me, I knew that underneath all of it, there was Emma down there. And when we were filming, it was like two completely different people. There was like Emma and then, Trunchbull and like when she when they'd say action and she'd switch into the character of Trunchbull it was so real and it was kind of scary but when they said caught she'd switch back into Emma. It's another must-see show and another star-studded opening on Broadway. It's one of the most provocative and exciting new plays of the season. Ain't No Mo also just celebrated its Broadway opening. It's a blend of satire and sketch comedy with a dose of drag. This opening makes Jordan E. Cooper the youngest playwright in Broadway history, and he's also the star. The 
Broadway show is back in just a sec. That's all for now. I'll see you next time. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and you're watching The Broadway Show.